Father, we thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. And above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious blood, for your holy written word, and the mighty Holy Spirit. It is with great joy, unspeakable, and full of glory that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. Further, we welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. And for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all the praise, the honor, and the glory with adoration and thanksgiving. I thank you for anointing this vessel of clay to minister life to your people boldly without fear, favor, or respect of persons, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but it will indeed prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We believe that we receive these petitions which we have desired of you, for we ask them in that mighty, matchless, and majestic name that is above every name, the name of Jesus and all the people of God said amen. amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want you to just lift your hands, everybody, and just give God a wave offering and just, just say glory to God. Thank God for Jesus. Praise the Most High God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You are good, and your mercy endures forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Praise God. I want you to open your Bibles, please, this morning to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, now, guys, I, I don't necessarily need as much uh, monitor here. Sounds like I'm getting a little bit of uh, feed in here. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Where did I tell you all to turn? Hebrews. I'm just checking on y'all. Make sure. Okay. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 9. Let's see. Okay. Hezekiah. Ah, amen. All right. Here we go. I'm glad some of y'all chuckled. Y'all caught that, didn't you? Praise, praise the Lord. All right. I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about practical ways, practical ways to live in these critical times. The way that things are, and you know, we as a people of God are not necessarily focused on everything that's going on around us, but I want to remind you that though we are in the world, we are not of the world. So we don't draw our reasoning and all of that from the spirit of the world. But we are dual citizens. We are citizens of the earth, as it were, or of this country, for example, but we're also citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? And so, yes, we do have a duality of citizenship. And one thing about it, uh, so that makes us ambassadors with two passports. That's typically what ambassadors are privileged to do. They, they hold clearance or privileged passports to enter into two different countries. Amen? And it's the same thing for us. That being said, as I said, we're in the world but not of the world, and we need to be quite conscious of that. Now, the Bible really is a very practical book. There are people that say, look, I don't understand it. There's some things don't make sense to me. Uh, and so forth. It isn't about sense. It's all about faith because the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. One thing, we should always be living in an eager anticipation of Jesus' return. Amen. Not necessarily as a, hey, quick Jesus, come get me out of this place. <laughs> All right. But that's the heart of the gospel, is the fact, among other things, is that he is returning again. Remember this, we are ambassadors for Christ, that we represent God on the face of this earth. As the scripture says in 1 John, as he is so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Mm. Now, 
parenthetical footnote right there. We're not hurling any new planets into orbit. When the Bible speaks about moving mountains, no chain, to my knowledge, has moved. I'm not saying people haven't tried to move them. But as far as I know, the, you know, the, the Rockies are still where they are. The Adirondacks up in the northeast, the Poconos, where these are Smoky Mountains just in our back door, so to speak, they're still there. So obviously, you must understand you're going to run across some passages of Scripture that are alluding to things in a natural sense, but dealing more with a spiritual backdrop. Amen. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. Go over to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, where Jesus says in verse 22, Have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, I, I don't know of any particularly recorded incident in which someone has spoken to a literal mountain, like the kind you climb, like the kind that gathers snow on the caps of them in the wintertime and things like that. So what exactly is Jesus saying here? We can experience things that we would put in the category of, oh my goodness, this is like a mountain. And we think about it actually from this scripture. Whether there are issues, problems that accrue in our lives, and we say, my God, this is, this is like a mountain. How, how will it move? Well, Jesus said, if, listen, I say to you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. So the key here is saying saying, speaking the word over whatever the issue is, over your own body, over whatever it might be that's troubling you, uh, a, a challenged relationship, a troublesome child you're trying to rear and put some sense into. <laughs> Amen. See, because you can't usurp authority over another person's will. But what you have to do where those things are concerned, and let's explore that for just a moment, because there's a lot going on. Children are making very bad decisions, doing stuff. And let me just say something, because a lot of, pa uh, not pastors, but parents and pastors probably, uh, get a little bit troubled about these things and look into themselves and say, well, did I do a good job raising these kids? How, where did they get that from? How did this go? Well, you can't be with your kids 24-7. I'm not offering that as an excuse. I'm offering that as a fact. You simply can't be with them 24-7. Now, here's the deal. I, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound like I'm going paradoxical on you a minute, and yet you can be with them 24-7 in spirit. Amen. In spirit. You know, I, I think about You say, well, how can you say such a thing? Well, I'm thinking back to an Old Testament event in which a man of God had an encounter with his own servant, Gehazi. Y'all remember that story? Well, you know, Naaman, a king of Syria, not a king, I'm sorry, a general of Syria, ended up with leprosy. And so, you know, he got word from his little maid in his house that there was a prophet who probably could get him healed of his leprosy. And so he went to the prophet's house and make a long story short, prophet didn't even come to the door. He sent his servant to meet the man. And the man said, just hold on here, general, be right back. He came back. He got a word from the prophet. Now, this is interesting. This is delegation. This is very interesting. Prophet didn't even come. Now, this is a high-ranking general in the Syrian army, and he's leprous, a horrible flesh-eating disease, and he wants healing. So the man of God sends his servant back with a word. It says, go and dip in the Jordan River seven times and then come again home. When this word came to the general, he was enraged. I think you'll find the story in 2 Kings chapter 5. He, got, he was enraged. He was upset. He said, surely. Now, you can tell he'd been around a few religious meetings or something. He said, now, surely the man of God would have come out, struck his hand over the leper, 
and, and thus brought about healing. We all have our funny ideas about how God's going to do something. <laughs> but you're never going to play armchair quarterback with the Most High God, all right? This shows that there are different ways that God heals. One way, but not the only way, is through the laying on of hands. Another one, of course, speaking the word over yourself. And so this man sent a word. The prophet sent a word. But isn't that what the scripture says in Psalms? He sent his word and healed them. Hmm? So it doesn't exactly say how he sent it. Although we can explore through the scripture and find out a number of different ways that God will send his word. He can send it through prophecy. He can send it through the word of wisdom, through the word of knowledge. He can send it through prophecy. I mean, he can send it any way that he wants to. And so in this case, he decided to send it through the man of God who then conveyed it to a servant who then delivered the word to the general. The general was upset, but thank God he had a good wise fellow that was in his entourage who said, now, sir, if the man of God had bid you to do something more difficult, because that's what we expect. We got to go over the river and through the woods to get God to do some things for us. Well, honestly, that kind of thinking is a frustration to the grace of God. Why? Because, oh man, Lord, help me here. <laughs> I want to unpack this slowly. Because when we are challenged with different issues in our lives, some provoked by others, some provoked by ourselves, some provoked by the devil himself or some unclean spirit, we can be challenged in our thinking, well, you know, God might not be too interested in doing this for me right now. Let me, let me get all this debris out of the way. Let me get all these mountains out of the way. Let me get all this stuff. But see, here's the thing. What do, you, what do you do with the scripture that says now, casting all your cares over on him because he cares for you? If he wanted you to move everything out of the way, he would tell you. That's one thing I know about Jesus. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you may be also. If it wasn't true, I, I would have told you. Amen. Amen. Now, I understand about this loading lumber over into the realm of the spirit. What are you going to do with that lumber? <laughs> Amen. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. So when you show up in glory, you already got a place to stay. There's no homelessness in heaven. No. No sorrow, no pain. None of the stuff that we go through down here. None of that's here. Amen. And so, yeah, that's right, amen, glory to God. Yeah. And a little child shall lead them. <laughs> amen. So, nevertheless, Jesus is saying there's power in the God kind of faith and in God's word to deal with anything. What wears us out is our thinking. Our minds get oppressed. Because time sort of deals with them. And, we, and when we get focused on the issues and the problems, we can't focus on God. Right. Now, you better believe that this is one of my favorite verses in Isaiah 26, 3, which says, He keeps them at perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. You ought to try that. In the midst of whatever you're dealing with, you ought to just try keeping your mind on the Lord. Excuse me, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult than you think. Because there's a temptation to take your mind off him. But what does it say? It says he keeps them at perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, for he careth for thee. That's kind of related to casting all the whole of your cares over on him because he cares for you. So out of the mouth of two or more witnesses, let every word be established. God cares for you. There's no such thing as God doesn't care or that God doesn't love. People ask me all the time, why is it that so many bad things happen, and even to good people? Well, you go all the way back to the beginning for that answer. God left this whole place in human charge. Amen. 
It's that way right now. Oh, yeah, it is. Because that's how God said. What did God say? He said, let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. Over the fish of the sea, fowls of the air, creeping things on the, uh, on the earth, so forth. But he never did say, let them have dominion over other people. He defined the scope meticulously. He said, here's what you have authority over. Here's what you can take dominion. People ask me, why, why did he do that? Why did he leave out usurping authority over men? He said, God did not create a world in which he wouldn't be needed. God's too, what the old folks used to say, God's too wise to make a mistake. Amen. Right. He knew the creation he was going to make when he made man in his own image and after his own likeness. You got to remember, I know the Bible says as he is, so are we in this world. But again, that's with measure. Why? Because see, Jesus had the spirit without measure. Meaning that all the rest of us have him by measure. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? We have him by measure. Psalm 8, ask the question, what is man that you are so mindful of him? And it says there in the verse, you made him a little lower than the angels. That's how the King James translated it. But the word angels comes from the Hebrew Elohim, meaning God. We're not made lower than the literal angelic hosts because, see, even by rank and file and order and the way God has systematically arranged the kingdom, the angels are called ministering spirits, spirits that serve. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth? <laughs> Check this out. Sent forth. I don't know about you. I look for them. You may not always recognize them, but you ought to expect them. They're sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. Point your finger at yourself and say, that's me. Say, I am an heir of salvation. That's, that's right. You're, you're more than an heir of salvation. You're a possessor of salvation. Because you've been saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You did not save yourself. But those angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. No. Now back to this uh, rank and file deal. Okay, so if that's the case, if angels are sent forth to minister to us or to serve us, and, but the scripture says we were made a little lower than the angels, what's up with that? Because, no, we're made a little lower than God. After God comes us. Amen. We're not God. We're made a little lower than God. Amen. So consequently, that's why I go back to the point that you know you're not going to hurl any more planets into orbit. You're not going to make any more real estate. Now, you, you can invest in real estate. You can buy real estate. You can trade real estate, sell real estate. But you're not going to make any more because whatever is there is there. So being made a little lower than God, the essence of that is that internally we indeed are as he is. Or I should say we potentially can be. And a lot of it, a lot of what we are as we are, as he is, we are in this earth, a lot of that has to do with a principle called impartation or imputation where God imputes, that's just a fancy word meaning he grants, he decrees and declares, and by sovereign authority, he being God, the creator of heaven and earth, makes us <laughs> what we are. He is the author, as revealed in Romans 4, 17, of calling those things which be not as though they were. Oh my God. Every time a person is saved, God is calling things that be not as though they were. In the course of our everyday lives, we have encounters with him and God is in the process of calling those things that be not as though they were. Even when you and I mess up, 
We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sin, now if we say we have no sin, the scripture says we lie and do not the truth. <laughs> yeah, somebody mentioned to me about uh, Jacob and his limp. That came after he had a little wrestling match with an angel. You know, Jacob's ladder, they call it. He wrestled with that angel said, I want you to bless me. The angel touched him in his thigh, and he walked with a limp ever since then. Amazing to me, man, that Jacob never asked God to come and heal that limp and get rid of it. But that's what he walked with. But nevertheless, God was no less gracious to him because of that issue. Now, I don't have time to unpack all that right now because there's a lot to unpack about Jacob wrestling with that angel and uh, you know, demanded that he, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I'm not going to let you go until you empower me. Amen. And then what happens? <laughs> Angel touches his thigh and the guy is limping. What, what kind of empowerment is that? I always like to argue the scripture to any of you that have been with me for any time. No, I do that because it makes me think. And I hope it makes you think also. But that's not what we're majoring on. All right. I want you to understand that as he is, so are we in this world, and the fact that we're made a little lower than God, not the angels, to give you perspective of who you are, what you are, what you have, what you can do in Christ Jesus. All right? And there's a lot, because in essence, on the inside of us, we can be just as he is, in character, in nature, and even in the supernatural. Again, we have the spirit by measure. Have there been other human beings that have raised other human beings from the dead? Yes, absolutely. There are recorded incidents. They're kind of few and far between, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that. But it has occurred. Probably one of the first instances of that, of someone being raised from the dead, apart from Jesus himself. You can go back to the Old Testament, where they were lowering a man of God into a grave. And he touched the bones of a dead prophet. They were, they were lowering a man in the grave. And when, when he did, when he made contact with the bones of the prophet that was all buried in there, life came back into him and he, he literally raised from the dead. Now, I, you know, I know that, boy, if Action News had been around on that one. <laughs> I, I, I can't help but wonder, what did the mourners think? that were gathered out there, the graveside service. <laughs> They're about to say goodbye, and a man, they, man makes contact with a prophet's bones and comes back to life. I'm sure it shocked and scared everybody. Oh, my goodness. We thought this fellow was gone. No pulse, nothing. We got him all wrapped up here, and boom, here he comes back to life. Well, again, now, these incidents are kind of few and far between, but there are, because we have the Spirit by measure, there are other things that can be a lot more regular and routine for us. All of the stuff that's going on in the world is primarily to try to distract us from that focus on the Word and the fact that it works. In fact, it will tempt you and try to convince you that it doesn't work. But it does. See, in these days and times, you have to take a stand. I remember teaching you earlier from the book of Daniel about the, the young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel himself. All of these men were tempted to the worth of their value to the kingdom of God. Every one of them. What do I mean by that? They were tempted. Tempted to bow down and worship an image in the name of saving their lives. But they didn't do it. Oh, remember that saying I told you all about, if 100 million people say something stupid, it's still stupid? All those folks in the Babylonian Empire, when the king said, when the music plays, y'all bow down and worship this image I set up out there, they were all bowing, except for these few young men. And somebody, as we say, ratted them out. Somebody told on them. And see, it gets complicated. So when you see stuff going on in today's times, in the political marketplace or whatever, right. 
It's the same stuff. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. It, there isn't. Same stuff. Somebody rose up, and maybe they had an issue with the king. It, well, wait a minute. See, I want to, let me back into this thing a little bit. So here they are out there in the plains of Dura. The king's got this image out. He's already given a decree and an order. Everybody bows down and worships the image. But these fellows don't. Now, I want to know, if you bowing down to the image, how could you see those guys not? Now, let's give a little margin here. Maybe there were a few monitors looking over everybody to make sure they were in compliance, right? But now watch out. They come to the king. Uh, excuse us, sir, sire. Uh, these young men you hired. They sit on your round table. They're in your council. They're advisors. They're important people in the empire. Uh, don't they do what you tell them to do? What special privilege do they have that they need not bow down themselves and worship the image which you have set up? Which you have said that if they don't, if nobody does, they are guilty of high treason against the king. What a king. He's wise, probably wise king. He says, okay, bring him here. Let's, let's examine him. Let's, let's have a hearing. Is it true? Is it true? I'm talking about it. It's just, it's just lodged in my spirit. Go over to Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. And uh, let, me, let me read into it from <clears throat> verse 14. Now notice, well, verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury, he's already upset to even hear about this, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to them, is it true? In other words, I'm not just taking these guys' word for it. I want to hear it from you. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Now, somewhere in this, there's a technique of cross-examination for you legal people, all right? Is it true uh, that do not you serve my gods and worship the golden image which I have set up? I get a feeling that the king knew they didn't do this kind of stuff. After all, remember, these young men were vetted by the king's eunuch and servant. Remember, these are the guys that Daniel said, look, give us pulse to eat. Don't serve us the king's meat. Give us a, a vegan diet or whatever. Keto, whatever, you know, y'all got all these different things. Mediterranean. Yeah, Mediterranean would probably be more appropriate for this region of the world. Just put us on the Mediterranean. We'll be, we'll be okay. And, and, you know, the eunuch would say, well, wait a minute now. I can't have y'all messing up here, man, because if you guys don't look good, my head is on the block. But anyway, you know, they ate 10 days that way, and they, the Bible says they were far better looking and far better health than all the rest of those guys. So what I'm trying to tell you is these boys have already been through a process of vetting. You're not going to sit and advise the king, and they don't know everything about you. They know what kind of toothpaste you use. They know how often you brush your teeth. They know when your trash was picked up from your house. They got all those details. So the king is not ignorant of who these fellows are. Mm -hmm. He's upset. He has become emotionally upset. See, in his rage and fury. Got it? Why is he in rage and fury? Because somebody dared to disobey him. So he, he is the supreme monarch. And are you telling me these fellows that sit at my table, they're not, they're not going to do what I say? No, because they know there's somebody over you. Now, if you be ready, and I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to name all these instruments here. For, uh, he said, if you be ready, then at what time you hear, let's just say, the band get down, right? Uh, and, you, and you fall down. And that's exactly what they would be doing. And worship the image which I've made well. But if you worship not. My brothers and sisters, you might say, Pastor, why are you even dealing with this passage? We heard you talk about this before. Because you're living in these days. Amen. It's not an image of gold set up in a field somewhere. 
the image is a little bit different. The image is being delivered through other instruments, like publications, like declarations, like legislation. The image is different, but it's the same principle. Is it true that you do not believe in our curriculum for your children? Now, uh, if y'all teach these kids that they're not sure of who they are or what they are, well, but if we give you the curriculum and you don't teach it or you don't agree to keep hidden from their parents the fact that we're trying to indoctrinate, the fact that we're trying to Manipulate, because that's exactly what it is. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is manipulation. Now, there's, there's more to it than that, but that, ultimately, that is the objective and the goal of all witchcraft and manipulation. And they're manipulating people. Now, if you do what we tell you and teach these kids who don't know any better, uh, everything's going to be okay. But if not, we're going to prosecute you. We're going to fire you. We're going to send you out there. You're not going to be able to make a living. You're going to be penniless. You're going to be homeless. You're going to be broke. And we're going to blackball you too so you can't get hired anyplace else. Uh, uh, can I get a witness? Oh. Oh, no, then, then this historical truth has some pertinency to it then. Huh? Right. In this case, with the king, he's got an image out there. He says, everybody bow down and worship it. And if they don't, we're going to put you to death. We haven't got to that point yet. I remember this old Three Stooges movie. I, boy, there's, there's some funny guys, you know. Now, you, you have to tell your children who they are. They may not know. Mo, Larry, and Curly. And I remember they used to have this little thing. It was so funny. Whenever they heard the... Niagara Falls. It says, slowly I turn, inch by inch, step by step. Thank you. <laughs> That's how the devil is trying to work his way through our culture and through the world. Slowly he turns, inch by inch, step by step. And then, you know, the, the outcome in the Three Stooges was they were going after some guys to assault them or whatever the case might be. I, I, I never understood why that provoked that situation, but who cares? Look, the, 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 whole point, the whole point is I'm trying to help you get a look at what your world looks like and where it all comes from. That is nothing new under the sun. It's the same thing. But now, if you worship not, I'm still in verse 15, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? They're still asking that question today. You're a Christian. Where's your God? How's he going to save you from this? We have the power. We have the authority. We have the money. We have the clout. This, that, it's nothing but Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. You think Babylon is named in the book of the Revelation just to fill space? No. There's a reason for that, that Babylon is named in the book of the Revelation speaking of future uh, events and the impact that the culture of Babylon still bears to this day. The occult was strong in the Babylonian Empire. It was strong in most of those ancient empires, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the, the Medes and the Persians, all of them. All of them were dibbling and dabbling in all that nonsense because the devil was in there trying to counterfeit everything. He can't create anything original. He just counterfeits what exists. He counterfeits governments. He counterfeits systems. He counterfeits worship. He count what No marvel for even Satan himself appears as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. This is why 
It is indispensable, my brothers and sisters. There is no option. You must learn to be led by the Holy Spirit because he's the only one who can navigate you through these times. He truly is. And you need, you need to know him. And you need to be able to listen and know this is, this is the word of God. That's why, you know, when I went to college, I listened to lectures, but I had to study books. I had to do both. So I studied the Bible, but I had to learn to listen to the lecturer, who is the Holy Spirit, who Jesus said would lead me and guide me into the truth. Now, I've not seen the Holy Spirit, what I call in bodily form, reach his hand out and say, come here, Joe, follow me. <laughs> no. No, he hadn't pushed me, he hadn't pulled me. How does he do it? Through the inward witness. His, the spirit of God speaks to my spirit and gives me checks and green lights. Go, don't go. Move, don't move. Say, don't say. And through that system, God leads us and guides us into, into the truth. And said he'll bring to our remembrance the things that he said. That's very important. Because if it can't be, whatever you're dealing with cannot be substantiated with the word of God, don't waste your time. Don't lose sleep over it. Don't sweat over it. If it cannot be confirmed, affirmed, and, and anchored, rooted and grounded in the word of God, don't bother with it. This is, this is the assault that's going on with your kids now. They're really going on with all of us. They're really trying to mess with our minds. Who, who, who are they? Your culture. And whoever's behind it. Whoever's being used to manipulate it. Oh, yeah, my friends. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. That's, that's exactly how it's working here. And so, look, okay. and, and same question. Who is that God that will deliver you out of my hands? Well, you Christians, uh, who's going to help you when you lose your job? Who's going to take care of your children? Well, see, if you look into them, you see what they're going to deliver you. But when you're looking to God, David said, I was once young. I am now old. <clears throat> but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. Remember what I said at the front end of this message, that what God has done for us, calling those things that be not as though they were, he has imputed righteousness to us. Maybe one of my favorite illustrations, of course, is Esther, who appeared at the king's palace without an invitation. And even though she was the queen, she had to have an invitation from the king to come into his court. But because she had an overarching and compelling reason, in other words, the reason was they're about to annihilate all of my people. Because Haman... The dude Satan used in that particular episode was out to take out all the Jews. Haman had an issue with Mordecai, who was a Jew and who also was cousin to Esther. Haman did not like him because Haman wanted Mordecai to bow down to him and all this kind of thing. And isn't that amazing? These little trivial things that motivate people to do incredibly evil and wicked and heinous things. So Haman had it all in for the Jews, and Esther is a Jew. Nobody knew it, though, except Mordecai. Haman didn't know she was a Jew. The king didn't know. And she went to the palace, and, I, and like I said, I'm sure the doorman said, hey, is the queen on the docket today for an audience with the king? No? Uh-oh. Man, we're about to see some real drama here today. The queen shows up without an invitation. And see, these guys probably been working that door for who knows how many years, seeing people that just showed up and ended up out there on the gallows hung because they had no invitation. Now they're saying, oh, man, there's going to be a royal mess here. But she comes in there, and the girl is real smart. She's got way wisdom. She got herself all dressed up. In other words, she was looking like the day the king decided to make her his wife. Oh, yeah, now. She can. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. She was ready. She's come down the red carpet. And the king, when he saw her, forgot all about the law. 
and extended the royal scepter to her. That gesture says, you are pardoned of all wrongdoing. Jesus is the scepter of God. On the cross, that was a scepter. It looked like an instrument of capital punishment, and it was on the earthly side of the ledger. But on the heavenly side of the ledger, it was a scepter. God used that cross with Jesus on it, just like the medical symbol to this day. You know, the serpent wrapped around the pole and all that kind of thing like that. He used that as a scepter and pointed to each and every one of us and said, your sins, although I know there are many, they have been pardoned. They have been eliminated. They have been remitted. We're approaching Easter. We're going to talk about this in depth and in detail as we move closer toward it. But it's important that we know this now. It's important we preach Jesus. It's important people really know who Jesus is. What, what is the Christ? What does it mean to be the anointed one? All of these things. But I love that story about Esther. And that king pointed that scepter. And listen, let me tell you something. That was it. Just one gesture was the end of it all. He didn't call for a tribunal. He didn't call for a hearing. He didn't call for uh, anything. He just pointed the scepter and said, you're my girl. Come on in. What's on your mind? Let's talk about it. Amen. Like Lattimore said, let's straighten it out. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And the queen's real wise. She said, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, sire, I'm going to have a little party. And I'm going to prepare all your favorite stuff. And, you know, I want you to come. And I'm going to invite a couple of people. And uh, I'll be glad to unfold the entire matter to you there. Now, I don't know that Esther knew all that was going to fall out of that situation because, see, Haman was one of the invitees. And he came in there. And to make a long story short, Esther unfolded the scandal to the king. And the king said, somebody wants to take you out. See, first of all, because see, when she disclosed to the king, I'm a Jew. These are my people. And the king said, what, are you telling me there's somebody in my kingdom that would dare to kill the queen and all of her kin? Yeah, this wicked Haman, that's him. Now, folks, Haman, <laughs> Haman was in a mess. He was so frightened. He was so afraid. See, folks, you bring the power of God to bear in a situation. It's amazing how the dynamics and the atmosphere and the environment change. Haman was now afraid for his life because he looked over at the king, and the king was like fuming. That king was just like Nebuchadnezzar was in this story, in rage and fury, to think somebody is going to assault his queen. And Haman took one look at the king and knew his life was about to be snuffed out. And he was begging and pleading, and he even, he even grabbed the queen. Oh, my goodness. The king said, you going to force the queen right here in my bedroom and in my presence? That gallow that you built for who you called your enemy, Mordecai, he, the king called the guards in there and his house, look, take this dude out and hang him on the gallows. I guess we could say Haman hung himself. There's no plot scheme that the devil's going to come up with that God's not going to deal with. Now, it's sad that everybody had to go through all the changes and all the arrangements and all that, but I'm going to tell you, in the end, God wins. Amen. And that's what I want to tell you all, because it's not, it's not only educators that are confronting this uh, Daniel chapter 3 scenario. Many people are, because there's a lot. Now, they, they use the term woke, woke companies, woke corporations who are basically, listen, I'm just going to be honest with you. They're bowing their knees 
If you can't see it, my brothers and sisters, look at what's going on in the culture. The culture is becoming absolutely desensitized to sin, desensitized to debauchery, desensitized to all evil and wickedness. That one, of, one of the 10 end time signs that I've taught you about over the years, the erasure of standards. One of the top Ivy League colleges in the country just said, we're no longer going to require SATs and ACTs. I don't know how many of you, I know I did, had to get into college on the basis of my SAT scores and ACT scores and all that. And you got one of the top Ivy League schools in the country says, we're no longer requiring that. They're lowering the requirements on law enforcement recruits. The devil isn't a fool, he makes fools. So they said, let's defund the police. Let's get rid of all the law enforcement. Let's wipe them out. Let's demoralize them. And crime is, is going, not is going to, is going through the roof. And they need officers so desperately that they're willing to eliminate what were once basic requirements for recruits. They're backing off certain physical qualifications. You ever see, you, come on, y'all watch those little crime shows on TV. You know, when a perp starts running away from the scene of crime and the officer's chasing him on foot, that officer got to be in good shape. He's got a sidearm. He's got all that stuff, his belt and everything. He's running, 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 climbing fences, jumping over him. Whatever. You got to be in shape. So if we back off the standards... What kind of law enforcement are we going to have? If they back off the standards in your colleges and universities, what kind of profess uh, pardon me, professionals are you going to have? It's not fair, they say, that one individual should be the valedictorian and another is a salutatorian. It's not fair. Everybody should be a valedictorian. Let's make them feel that way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not making a political statement. When I speak to you like this, I'm speaking as a man of God, as a prophet of God, and I'm speaking from the principle and the basis of the word of God. Amen. The Bible identifies something as the spirit of a slack hand. And the erasure of standards is a manifestation of a slack hand. Because, see, here's the principle that I've been teaching it to you for years. You said, well, pastor's got all these little witty sayings. There ain't no witty sayings. There's truth behind this thing. Let me explain something to you. See, look at the world. Look at the world. Whatever it can't control, it decriminalizes. And then turn around and legalize. That's the reason why. When they catch perpetrators, whether they burglarized your home, stole your car, assaulted you with whatever weapon they use, they talk about, well, let's get the guns off the street. Well, that's fine. Sweep them all off. The problem is you can't sweep violence out of the heart of an individual. And so if they decide they want to be violent against you, they'll take, in other words, can I, can I quote Spike Lee, by any means necessary. So they pick up a rock, they pick up a tire iron, they pick up an old tire on the side of the street, or like those kids up in my hometown, Philadelphia, they grabbed a, a, a traffic cone and beat a, an elderly man. Oh, I think he died. Whatever they can get their hands on, as far as I know, those kids did not pull out a weapon. They did not shoot the man. They grabbed a traffic cone and whipped his head and kicked him and beat him up when he fell down on the ground. No telling, probably had, you know, cracked ribs and bruises and blunt force trauma all over his body and it ultimately he died from his injuries it isn't the instrument my brothers and sisters the bible says everybody say the bible says right? the human heart is wicked beyond measure who can know it humanity can become so depraved and deprived till god says I have Noah built an ark. The destruction of all flesh is come before me. How wicked was that generation? 
that God had to bring about a flood and wipe it out. And I want you to understand something because, see, God is righteous in all his doings and all his dealings. He didn't go back to the dirt to make new men and new women. He preserved Noah. How did Noah get on that boat? How did his wife get on that boat? How did Noah's three sons and three wives get on that boat? I'll tell you how it, it said that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's how he got on that boat. For all practical purposes, God counted him and his house righteous before him. And God preserved him and his family and, and started humanity all over again with them. Now, you got to understand something. Noah and his wife and the, and the, and the sons-in-law and the daughters-in-law, or rather his sons and the daughters-in-law, yeah, they weren't perfect. Remember now, Noah was 500 years old. He lived a long time to see a whole lot of stuff and hear a whole lot of stuff. We're not told the ages of his sons or his wife, but no doubt they witnessed a lot of what the cultural dynamics and issues were during the time. In other words, what I'm saying to you, they were a witness to whatever it was that provoked God to send this flood. Are you listening to me? And so he did. And God started over again with Noah and his sons. And everybody's arguing today about who came from who. It doesn't matter. We all sprung from Adam. So you can stop any place on the ancestry line that you want to. I just want, you, I just want to remind you, the Bible says, still says in the New Testament, thousands of years past Noah's time, by one man, sin came into the world. And it wasn't Noah. It wasn't either one of his sons. It wasn't his wife. By one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. One man. Who was the man? Adam. So you can stop at Noah's three sons if you want to, but you, hey, you better go all the way back and figure out what has happened. So in other words, that same genealogy that proceeded from Adam has still gone on down to this day. And see, it was Paul that wrote in the book of Romans the fact that by one man, sin entered into the world. And he said, by the righteousness of one man, Jesus, many were made righteous. Glory to God. Oh, yes, my brother and sisters, this is sobering stuff. But it's things that we need to think about. It's things that we need. I, I bring them to you just to provoke you to remember who you are and what you are. And stop running around expecting the worst. It's bad out there. I know it is. These folks are going crazy. Suicides are through the roof. Murders are through. Have you ever seen a time when there have been more murder-suicide events? Folks in their own houses wiping an entire family out than themselves. Somebody said if they started with themselves, they'd have saved three or four other lives. But that's what the spirit is out there. Murder Madness and mayhem. World is conscious that there is, they call it mental illness. They, they, you see, they can't, they don't understand spiritual dynamics. They're aware of them. They're sensitive to them. But they lack the, the acumen, the biblical acumen to identify that thing. Case in point. And then I'm going to wrap up here. Case in point, this lawyer that just got two consecutive life sentences in South Carolina. I don't know if you all heard the judge speak to the man before he laid sentence. Oh, if you did, raise your hand. I'm just, yeah, right. Okay, it, it was a case of interest. I'm not going to call you all carnal because you watched it. It was a sensational case. Let's be real. This guy's family ran a legal dynasty for a century up there. As the judge said, you were in here prosecuting all kind of people, many of them going to the death chamber for far less than what you did. I like the judge. <laughs> he was cool. 
Mr. Newman, Judge Newman, he, he was cool. I, I was amazed. And I don't know whether you all knew it or not. Judge Newman lost his youngest son in January of this year. His youngest son died of a cardiac event. He was about 40 years old, had a promising future. I think he was, in fact, he was in politics. He was a city councilman. But he, but he collapsed and died. And here's a judge sitting on this bench, and he's got to go through all this and listen to all this drama for six weeks. And his son, his own son, died somewhere either at the beginning of this trial or near the edge of it somewhere or another. And that judge was cool, and he, he was meeting out justice and dealing with that situation. But you see, the judge... This is what clued me in on. This man's got some spiritual understanding. I know he's a Methodist. He attended, oh yeah, pastor researchers, okay. <laughs> he, he attended a Methodist church. But somewhere along the line, whether the Methodist told him or whether he was taking some supplemental teaching from other sources, he said to the man, when the man said, you have it, the judge said, you got anything to say? He said, I, I, I would never kill my wife and my son. Judge said, well, maybe you didn't. Maybe it was the monster you became. Now, now the judge didn't have to break it down, but when he said that, I knew exactly what he meant. Now, he talked about the pills the guy was taking. Now, I'm going to be honest with that. It's a stretch to tell me you on 40 or 50 pills a day. You dead already. If you're taking 40 or 50 pills a day, you, you already OD'd. <laughs> you can't take three or four Percocet pills or whatever and not drop dead. So just said, maybe it's the monster you became. And that's me when I know. I said, this judge knows something here. You see, it's an amazing thing. They put him on the stand, but they could never get the devil out of him and put him on the stand. But the judge acknowledged, yeah, you, 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 you got some spiritual issues here. The problem is we, we, if we could extract the devil and put him on trial, then maybe he could serve the time for you, but he can't. <laughs> but you are. And he said the, the officers of the court may take him away. It, it was just amazing. You see, my brothers and sisters, there's nothing wrong with you being aware of what's going on around you. Never lose sight of who you are and whose you are. That's what I'm telling you. I'd love to stay up here and minister to you all another hour or so because I touched on a couple of things because I have to deal with these things in real time and real life and especially about your children and the issues that you're going through as professionals, as employees, as employers, at, at all the other interactive things that go on with your families and your communities and your children and what they're exposed to and what these folks are trying. It baffles me, although not totally, it baffles me how some people can support these kinds of things. It's baffling. Not, I'm not totally baffled because, look, I understand. That's the way of the world. There goes earth, wind, and fire. Okay, so. That's the way of the world. That's how they think. That's Y'all know me. Come on now. Praise the Lord. That's how they think. That's how they operate. That's how they talk. That's how they do. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. We as believers are almost like salmon swimming upstream. We're, we're swimming against the current. So when I ask you, Christian, who is that God? that will save you and deliver you from out of our hands. You tell them what these boys told them. Not only is our God able to do it, he'll do it. Amen. On the authority of God's word, he won't leave you hanging out there. If you're bold enough, if listen, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father, which is in heaven. Obviously, the reciprocal must be true. If you're not ashamed of him before men, he won't be ashamed of you before your Father in heaven. God will show himself strong on your behalf. 
Don't you struggle with how he's going to do it. These young men probably didn't know the means and method by which God would deliver them out of that furnace. They just knew God would deliver them. They trusted God enough. They knew him well enough to say, hey, you know what, King? Not only is he able, but he will deliver us from out of your hand. You challenge. You, King, you challenge the Most High God. You have no idea what that looks like. The king challenged the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He, excuse me, folks, he tried to bring God down to his own level. And you can't do that. Don't you try. The king tried. And I tell you what, the king is fortunate that he escaped with his life. But he witnessed three men he was about to condemn to death come out of that furnace and it changed the word of the king. It always does. We just need some folks in places and positions who will say not only is our God able, but he will deliver us from out of your hand. How bold are you? How strong are you? How convinced are you? How fully persuaded are you to stand on the word of God? Stand on it. Trust him. I've said so many times, I don't believe there's anything God loves more than to be trusted. Father, my soul magnifies the Lord. And I rejoice in you, my Savior. Glory and honor and praise and might and power and dominion are yours, O God, from everlasting to everlasting, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Your name is to be praised I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Benefits. Benefits put in place. For the word of the Lord says he has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Thank you, Father. No weapon formed against us shall pros prosper. Every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, we shall condemn or prove to be in the wrong. Because this is our heritage as servants of the Most High God. And our righteousness is of you. We did not manufacture our own righteousness. Our righteousness is of you. Glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Even those of you that are with us by streaming, I believe you sense the presence of God where you are, listening to this word, witnessing this event, knowing that God truly is everything that he says that he is. If he said it, he will do it. And if he spoke it, he will make it good. Thank you, Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. I want to say to those of you that are tuned in by our live stream, whoever you are and wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, make him Lord of your life today. Yeah, I said it like that. Make him the Lord of your life today. You see, that is your decision. That, that should be your choice. Moses told the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I put before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. But Moses said, choose life so that you and your seed may live. Because choices do have consequences. And consequences are not all negative. It sounds bad, but it's not always bad. The consequence of making Jesus the Lord of your life is you become a part of God's family. You become God's child. You become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with all the rights, privileges, practices, and principles thereunto. All of it. And that is a great way to live. And now I invite you to come with us as we go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Just bow your head where you are and pray this prayer from your heart. and Say, dear God in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life, I have sinned 
and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin, is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified, just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer with us, congratulations and welcome into the family of God. You have passed literally from death to life, from spiritual death to eternal life. And now the world is new. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new.